the show where anything goes. Motivation, mindset, recovery, philosophy, and life. We become who we are through what we experience. We all have a story, and this is my backstory with Josh Boyer. So here we are, man. It's the My Backstory podcast, episode number 10. I'm here with uh, Eddie Copeland. Eddie Copeland and I actually uh, went to high school together. He's a two years uh, older than me. So he graduated in uh, 98. I graduated in 2000 in the lovely city of uh, Temple City, California, a town that only we know. <laughs> so it's, it's funny, man. You're from California and people are like, hey, where are you from? I'm like, oh, Temple City. I have no clue where that is. Well, you know where Arcadia is? Oh, yeah, yeah. I know where Arcadia is. <laughs> They're the same size and right next door to each other. But I think it's the racetrack and the mall, whatever, that kind of make that where you don't know Temple City, but you know Arcadia. But anyway, I'm here with Eddie and I want I actually was reaching out to Eddie because I know he's an amazing leader uh, firsthand. I've met with Eddie a couple times. Um, I wanted to get into like physique uh, competitions and Eddie and his wife, Janelle, uh, were getting into that game and were absolutely crushing. I was watching their progress online and I was like, man, this is amazing. So I met with Eddie on that and he kind of gave me, uh, you know, laid out the the groundwork of how I needed to get ready to like go into a competition. I ended up not you know, going through with it. My wife got pregnant, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> um, but then uh, he started a, a face uh, on the online uh, Facebook group um, called Lead. And him and Janelle are actually helping people start their businesses, like entrepreneurs, how to like run their business, how to make it profitable. And uh, so I knew he'd be a great person to get on this podcast. I want him to share his story, you know, where he uh, where he came up, like where he was born, um, kind of like what he learned along the way what things he went through and uh, what he's up to now. And so he's going to share his backstory. So without further ado, man, here's Eddie. Hey, how's it going? What's up, brother? Good, good. It's funny that you mentioned the Temple City thing. No one, no one ever knowing what it, where it is, <laughs> if it even exists. Right. Because I remember uh, hearing about moving, getting ready to move to Temple City when I was, uh, I got to say, I was probably 13 right. or 14 or whatever. And uh, my stepdad at the time and my mom had, got married and all this kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden they're saying, Hey, we're going to move to Temple city. I was like, who knew about Temple city? Like, was it him or was it your mom? I think he drew, drove as far as he could from our family. <laughs> <laughs> from our, like, you know, you have your, your, yeah. your, your, uh, your, your collective family. I think he wanted to go as far as he possibly could, uh, to get as far as away from them as, as possible. Right. I don't know. I, 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 obviously that's negative thinking, but I think that that's what he did. But then when he found it, I was like, this is crazy. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And so now when I describe it to people, you say Arcadia, I say, you know, Pasadena, yeah, San Gabriel. Yeah. You always right. have to give the surrounding cities. Yeah. It's in the middle of all that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I usually use Pasadena a lot too because everyone knows, you know, Rose Bowl. And yeah, stuff, like, yeah. Pasadena. Yeah. So we were, we were actually, speaking of backstory, we were actually living in Inglewood, California. Um, I was kind of born and raised there. It was like what I knew as home, right? You know, I learned everything there from playing basketball to uh, friends to to everything, yeah. you know. Um, was, that was, even now, I, this, it has a special part in my life because, you know, I can go into the city and just like feel like home. Like, you know, it's perfect weather. You has know. it changed much since you were a kid? Uh, it has, it has. Now the stadium is coming there. That's right. So there's a lot of gentrification okay. going on. So like, you know, the rent's going up, the housing market is, you know, people are just buying up lots of land. Because, we should have got on that, bro. Before I, know. They, I, I was thinking about it. I was like, man, we should have bought a house there like now or like, you know, maybe five years ago. Yeah. It's like go up. as soon as they were talking about it. But um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I mean, my mom still lives there. She, oh, really? She, yeah. So it's interesting. She, we moved to Temple City. She, you know, we lived there for a while. She got divorced. And then... Um, you know, and then moved to Monrovia and then was just like, I need to move back home. Right. And then she went back to Inglewood. Oh, wow. Uh, so, which is interesting. It was funny because I would love to visit Inglewood and I love Inglewood, but I would never want to live there anymore. Really? But um, Is it rough? I mean, I, I know growing up, um, I lived in Temple City for the first part of my life, like kindergarten and whatnot. And then I moved to Rialto yeah. and uh, San Bernardino, which are both pretty rough you know yeah and i remember as a kid hearing about like inglewood it's kind of like the same thing as you know i guess compton um watts kind of the same general yeah. area so yeah what's funny is that when i was a kid i don't think i thought of it being rough 
I thought of it being like, this is how you lived. Like, I remember getting my basketball stolen. I remember like, you know, walking to the park and it would be like, you would see some rough people around and you would say, oh, okay. You knew the rules of what you needed to do and and, and how you handled yourself. And I don't think I necessarily thought of it as being rough, but when I look back at it, it was, it could have been considered that. Now, Inglewood's interesting because there's a part of Inglewood and it's really called Ladera Heights that gets into kind of what they call like Black Beverly Hills is where a lot of the, <laughs> the Lakers, you know, in the eighties lived. And if you were successful, you lived in Ladera Heights and they, right. you know, really expensive homes and stuff like that. So it's this really interesting dynamic because you have the closer you got to Crenshaw, the, the rougher it got. Right. right. And so, and then there's a lot of, you know, amazing athletes that came out of Inglewood. You have like Harold Minor, um, I think Baron Davis, um, Eldon Campbell, like all these people, Byron Scott, um, yeah, Reggie Theus, like all these people who came from Inglewood. And um, so it's had a really great track record of athletes. And so uh, I learned how to play basketball, which, you know, we, you know, when I was in high school, I played baller, ball. straight baller. <laughs> Definitely. I used to love watching you play, man. I, that's one sport, man, that I wish like I'm six one. I'm not like super tall, but it's one sport that I wish I would have played. Um but I just never got into it. Yeah. Like football kind of took my attention. Um, and that was it. That was a wrap for me. And I, I, I felt like I was okay at football. I was a pretty good average player. And I was like, I'll just stick with this. Yeah. But hindsight being 2020, man, I wish I would have played ball, you know, but I yeah. loved watching it, man, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was great. I mean, I think that's for me was big because going from Inglewood and then living there for all my life, you, yeah. you kind of get an idea of this world right in that small world and this is what people look like right and they all look like me right black or hispanic or samoan or whatever the case may be and then moving to temple city and going oh my god like i would sit in classrooms and i was only black kid and i remember going to oak at the time uh and realizing that there was no one who looked like me i think there was probably one other kid that looked like me and and I remember that being, now that I reflect on it, I remember that being a time where I was just like, I had to like figure out who I was and just like, I was a loner at the time. I think I had one friend yeah. and it wasn't because I wasn't accepted. It was just because I assumed that acceptance wasn't going to be there. Right. Right. And I so, was hoping this, this topic was going to come up, by the way. Oh, really? <laughs> I really did because it's something that I can look back on and be like, when I was in high school, I mean, I was two years behind you and like there weren't that many black people at Temple City. No. There was a, a, maybe I can think of on my, like probably two hands, dude, how many there were, yeah. five to 10, maybe, you know? And the reason I think about it is because like, what was that like for you, man? Yeah. What was that like for you guys like that were not like, you were the minority in yeah. a, in a, in a area where when we went to school there was predominantly, I'd say Caucasian yeah, most yeah. likely. And then, I mean, now it's, it's a little different. It's more Asian than, yeah. than anything else, but it had to be, challenging and different for you. I mean, I experienced yeah. it when I moved to Texas, but I want to hear your your side on that. Like, what yeah. was that like? You know, when I look back at it, th- there was definitely times where my identity was something I, I struggled with. I struggled with like being accepted at, at an age when, you know, you're 13, 14, 15 years old, and you're trying to figure out who you are. You're, you're growing up, adolescence, puberty, all these things are happening. And you are not finding a connection that you were on the path of probably having with with different individuals that just from the same background. And so it it was a hard thing for me at first. And then I think it was basketball that was kind of like my salvation because if I didn't have that, I don't know, I probably would have been a lot of like, I think what happens a lot of inner city kids go to predominantly white areas and they, either have a connection through something, or if they don't, they just become a ruckus. Right. They become, they just bring that society thought process and, and that idea that I have to be this person. And then they end up being, getting in trouble. And I think for me, it was playing basketball. It was um, meeting people like Denny Ogden, who uh, was an awesome basketball player. I remember Denny. Yeah. I, for, I actually forgot him until you just mentioned him yeah, right now. Man. Yeah. He was a stud for sure. Yeah. And then having like, um, like Coach Hollinger, you know, um, I never felt like I was a different color. I never felt anything that in that way. He just embraced me. Uh, his parents used to make me lunch every day for school. So awesome. and not that I didn't have lunch, but they right. wanted me to eat well. Right. Uh, and 
it was just a wonderful thing, you know, and I think that that was something I just leaned into. And I think I just poured everything I had into playing basketball. I poured everything I had into those relationships. And then I, I say this now, especially to my wife, I said, moving to Temple City was the greatest thing I could have ever done. Like really? at the time, I thought it was horrible. Yeah. But as far as making up a person, like you think about creating who you are, like being that diverse. Now I... Like I have really good friends that are not black. I have Asian best friends. I have white best friends. I have, you know, all the different multicultures. And that wouldn't have happened. Right. And there's so much that's lost. And I, I truly believe in proximity is everything. I think a lot of the things that we see in our country as far as the divide is proximity, right? Absolutely. Right. When you're not near people that are different, then you don't adapt or understand or have empathy to how they think and how they feel. Right. And so um, it was great. I, and it, and well, the cool thing about Simple City is, and I never felt racism like at all. I didn't feel like someone doesn't like me because I'm black. You know, yeah. I mean, I had some run-ins, but I think people were just being knuckleheads and just for sure know. they were at that age too. Yeah. when they were trying to find themselves as well. And Absolutely, so, yeah. and so I never felt like, oh my god, I'm being discriminated ever, right? And I and, and what was interesting is that, you know, I think being young enough not to have those, like if I was probably. 16 or 17 I came over and there was a lot of uh conditioning about the man kind of thing to be you know c communicated to me then I probably would have had some type of chip on my shoulder like oh okay this didn't happen I start creating narratives and and things that are may not be true but make me feel better about things um and I didn't do that and so I think that that really helped a lot that's awesome man yeah that's super cool because I always wondered like you know I want to hear the other side hear the yeah. other perspective because I was in a school that was all the people look like me. You know yeah, I mean? So yeah. it was no different for me. I mean, I, I experienced, uh, I guess you called reverse racism, whatever. When I moved to Texas, it was, uh, a lot of like Hispanics. Yeah. And my stepdad was Hispanic. So like, I mean, I felt like a connection to Hispanics cause my stepdad was Hispanic, but I didn't fit in with them. So yeah. like I had to grow up kind of learning my way, like finding my way, you know, and there were, there was time where, you know, a stupid white boy, you know, slam me into lockers and stuff like that. Yeah. And I was like chubby, you know, fat kid in junior high. And like, uh, I used to get fucked with all the time, man. Yeah. It was bad. Um, yeah. and so I had to find my own voice. I had to find my inner strength and find out who I really was. And in eighth grade, I moved back to temple city. And, yeah. um, and then again, dude, I came back and it was like, I dressed differently than everyone. I talked differently than mm. everyone. And so again, I had to find like my niche. And for yeah. me, like you said, basketball for me, it was football. So I started playing at, uh, the temple city youth, like uh, football, whatever. And uh, I was an average football player. So like, it was like, that was my connection to other people. Cause I yeah. didn't know, I didn't know anybody. I mean, I went to kindergarten with some of these guys, but like, I don't remember them from kindergarten, right, right. you know, uh, maybe the names or something like that, but that was about it. And uh, so I had to find myself and, and I think football helped define like the direction I was going to take while I was in school. Yeah. But, um, so you were at Temple City and then when you were done playing basketball, did you, were you going to go to college? Like what was your, yeah. so um, it's interesting because after doing really well and, and, and playing basketball and getting recruited and you know having some schools, um, I realized that like I didn't know when to take SATs. I didn't know when to do clearinghouse. I didn't know a lot of those things, and so that put me into a really situation where I had to think about going to JC. And so I ended up going to uh, Glendale. Okay. playing basketball there and I did really well. I mean, I got a freshman of the year, averaged a ton of points, got more recruiting. And then, um, uh, my girlfriend at the time got pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, I remember when she told me I, and you know, we were sitting in a car and I was just like, Oh man, what do I do now? Oh yeah. You know? And, and, and I'll back up a little bit because my life changed the most after my car accident, I don't think I ever told you about this. No. Right. So, um, I took, I played basketball and then during the summer and then actually into the, the new year, I was like almost taking a year off because I was broke. I had a car that kept breaking down and I wanted to make some money so that I can get back and forth to school. Right. And, um, so I end up working construction of all things. Right. Nice. <laughs> and then I'll never forget. Cause I, um, I went to work and they were like, if you start here, you'll probably never leave. And I was like, no, nah, I'm just doing it for a, a, you know, half a semester, make some money so I can buy a car and not have to worry about getting back and forth to school. Right. I can focus on basketball, my education, and then keep it going. And like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. And I was like, what? 
That's not that's nice thinking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we get and, stuck. And then you know, so I was working construction, and you you work with a lot of different people in construction, like right? people have who just got out of prison, you know, oh, yeah. who, you know, and you can just see like they've changed. Like I don't know who you were before, but you are a different human being now. And so I worked for construction for a little while, and then you know. I just started living this life, right? And I just started living this life where I was out all the time. You know, there's obviously women and then there's, you know, alcohol with friends. And then you just end up getting in all kinds of like trouble or you just do things that are just not smart. And yeah, you're just guilty by association a lot Absolutely, of times too. Yeah. absolutely. And so um, I just, my life was just kind of going to places where some nights I was just sleeping in my car. Or, you know, I had moved out of my house because I had gotten into this big argument with my stepdad. Uh, and it was just like living in LA, yeah. right? And being going from Temple City now back in LA, and with good friends of mine, but at the same time, we just were not in the right mindset. I'm making a good, good decision. And uh, so one night, um, I had taken, I had decided to help my stepdad with this DJ gig because he was a DJ and he used to DJ weddings and stuff like this. So he got a party that he wanted me to do, and it was Santa Monica, right? So I was like, all right, I'll. I'll do it. Uh, he was going to pay me for it. I needed the money. And so um, I started the day off really early in the morning, went to the DMV, did all this other different things, uh, picked up a buddy of mine who's a rapper, right? right? And he's a good friend of mine. But it seems like with this particular friend, every time um, we were hanging out, something bad happens. Yeah. <laughs> so Murphy's Law. Yeah, yeah. So we, we go to, to the DJ gig and um, doing the party. It was, it was awesome. We we're hanging out. Uh, stayed after the party to hang out with some people from there and was out really, really late and, you know, maybe had a few things to drink and all those kind of things. And so uh, we get in the car and I drive down, I think it was on a 10 freeway, exit the freeway on Crenshaw. I'm driving and I don't remember anything. Oh, wow. Yeah. I completely black out. And um, all I remember is spinning in an intersection. Like my car is literally spinning in an inter intersection. Sure. So right on Crenshaw and Slauson, I had careened into a car and it spun out of control. Mm. And so I, my car stops in the middle of the intersection uh, and I'm like, what is going on? I, like I literally woke up because of the accident. Wow. And um, I, I pull over into the, the nearest gas station, which, which is right next to it. And... Uh, I'm completely fine. Nothing. I think I just like hit my knee on the on the dash a little bit, and uh, the, my friend he actually hit the windshield and bounced back. Oh wow! So, uh, and he w he woke up from, and I don't know if we had been drugged or whatever the case may be, but I don't remember any of the intersections leading up to that. And and I'll have to tell you, Josh, there's probably four to five intersections from the freeway to where my accident happened. I have no idea. Wow. Uh, so I pull into the gas station and at the gas station, so this is Crenshaw in the 90s, right? Or the late 90s. And there was people everywhere, right? right? And so there was a crowd of people in the gas station who saw the accident. And um, because I was, had just come from working, I had cash in the car, right? That had slid underneath from the seat because I put it underneath the seat right. and that slid back uh, like in vis visible sight for anyone looking in the car. And plus my car was filled with equipment. Mm. And so... People went from saying, are you all right, to- What can we take from you? Right. Oh. So this turned into a huge altercation, right? And so I'm, I'm literally like trying to find like what's going on. And immediately I'm being like attacked. Like people are trying to get into my car. They're trying to steal my CDs. They're trying to steal my money that's coming, that's in their car. And they're trying to steal the equipment. And so I'm like, How, what do I do? I don't have a cell phone at this time, right? Yeah. So, and I need to call my stepdad. I got to call my mom. I got to like, I'm only like, at this time, I think I was 19. You just graduated. Yeah. And so, at this time, I'm, I'm in the middle of a fight, yeah. right? And so, I'm fighting off two people who are trying to get in my car. And, and you know, we're going back and forth. My buddy is still in the car. Like, he hasn't gotten out of the car. I don't know if he's just like... So you jacked up been, I have no idea. Right. So uh, I'm going around in a circle with these guys. They're, they're, and, and I'm 6'2". I'm, you know, I was yeah, in pretty good dude. shape. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm going back and forth with these guys. And, and then all I know is that a bell goes off. Bing, and someone has 
hit me across my face mm. and uh, in, in my, it rocked me. Yeah. And so like, I'm like, my vision was blurred and, you know, and I, I kind of like, was, I was walking around, I was trying to get back to my car just to like, make sure everything was in there, like lock it all up. And, um, and then eventually the police come. So hearing about it from another perspective, because I knew people that were kind of there right. well, I, by association. So someone that was there and knew my cousin and told them the story from their perspective. And, and I guess the guy that hit me got, thank God he, that I didn't see him because he had a gun in the small of his back. And if I would have turned to him, you know, we wouldn't yeah, be probably knows? having this podcast. Right. right. So, um, that was a, a big turning point for me, you know, and being robbed, you know, obviously they robbed me for everything. And, and, um, oh, so they ended up getting in the car and taking everything. They got the money. They didn't take the equipment because it was too big. And then the police came. Um, but the crazy thing is that the police were across the street the entire time this is going on. It's like a commonplace for them. Yeah. In that so neighborhood, they, so yeah. Like, they were just sitting there and they saw it going on. And it was like, Unless we see a gunshot, probably we're not going to intervene. Plus, there was a crowd of people there. Such bullshit, man. So, um, yeah. And so, this was a, a pretty traumatic experience for me because oh, yeah, for you know, sure, I had to, uh, my nose is still broken, which I'm going to get fixed soon. <laughs> <laughs> Can't tell. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it was, it was one of those things where you go, you go, what am I doing? Why am I here? Right. Like, I, you know, I had a life that I could have gone to, you know, I had a you know a handful of schools I could go I can go to. I'm trapped into this life of trying to make money, yeah. and then you get into this cycle where you need now you need more money to keep up the lifestyle you're living. And then I get into this horrible accident. My car is totaled, mm. right? I don't even know where the car is that I hit while this is going on. Wow, right? So you don't know if those people are okay. You don't know where their car is. <laughs> Nothing, right? Man. And so I remember just having a breakdown. Like just not emotionally ready for all of this, right? Not ready for a car accident, not ready to be robbed and, and have to fight and and not ready to like come to grips with like, what do I do now? Like my car was my only source of income because I was working construction, I had to drive all the way to Santa Barbara, whatever the job was. And I was just lost, right? And so um, I, I called my parents, all this kind of stuff and I had to go to the hospital and and got home, you know, a day later and sat in my room and I was just like, what now? Yeah. You know, and so um, I, um, I started, I said, I just need to get a job because I just need to work and I don't, I don't, I'll get back into school. I have no idea what I'm going to do. And so uh, I started working at Best Buy. Yeah, I remember you working there. Yeah, I worked yeah. right around the corner, right in the same uh, shopping center, actually. Yeah. Chicks, yeah. Yeah. And I, I went in for, I th you know, and I had been working and hustling my whole life. I mean, I was selling peanuts in front of Kmart when I was like, <laughs> when I first moved to Temple City, you know that P Kmart? Yeah, right there on Rosemary? Yeah, yeah, so every summer I would sell peanuts. That's awesome. Yeah, for, uh, so we would, it was so funny because I had this name tag that said Boys Club with the Z, right? <laughs> and so Boys we're selling club. peanuts in front of Kmart every day, making 50 bucks a day. Nice. Right, I mean, and at the so time, it's, it makes good money. Yeah, and at the time, like polo was in. Yeah. So I would spend like all that money on nice clothes, uh, and then like I, so that was so I had been working for a long time. So I, I just felt like I had to work, right? Yeah. And so I went to Best Buy, and I remember getting hired there, and I was just seasonal, yeah. and I, and I worked on the um, merch team. And this is when we had like tube television, so like thirty six inch televisions were like two hundred pounds, or it was like crazy, yeah. and um. So my plan was I was going to work a little bit and then I was just going to get back in the school, get back on the team and just carry on with my life and put all this behind me. Uh, and then kind of fast forward to the, where I find out my girlfriend at the time is pregnant and all those just plans go to, to crap. And the thing I remember most was all of the players that I played with that were talented all had kids. And I used to always ask myself, how do you support your kids like playing basketball? We had 18 units of class for school and you had, you know, three hours of practice. Like, how do you, and I just realized that they weren't, I just kind of, they're not being, they're not fathers. Right. And I didn't grow up with a father. I didn't even know my father. Right. And so it was important to me that, you know, what had been done was done and I needed to man up. And so I 
put all that off and say, I'm not going back to school. I'm going to work. I'm going to support my family. And so that's why I stopped playing. Wow. Yeah. That's heavy, dude, because yeah. that's like most people probably at that fork in the road, they're probably going to make the other choice you know yeah. I mean? that you saw those other athletes making because they probably see the bigger picture of like, oh man, I could make millions in the pros or I can do whatever. And I think being that I watched you play in high school and you see how people progress through, you know, through college and so you have better coaching and better strength yeah. and conditioning and this and that, you probably would have made it. Yeah. I mean, I was definitely well averaging 30 points a game. Yeah. yeah, yeah you know, that's not, that, that's not an easy thing. And so, and what that does to your ego at the time was like, oh, yeah. oh, I could do anything, right. you know? And, um, so I started working and that competitiveness that I had in basketball, that, that drive, because I remember like training in the off season and like constantly telling myself, this is how you're going to do it. 30 points a game, 30 points a game, running bleacher miles, doing all those things. And so that drive, I put it into um, Best Buy right. of all things. Right. And I said, and I just said to myself, I remember the first six months was just like part-time work. And then when I found out she was pregnant, then I said to myself, okay, this has got, I got to find a way to make something happen. You became a manager, right? Huh? You became a manager though, didn't you? Yeah, so <laughs> what's just crazy is that first six months I was seasonal, I walked over to a guy who went to the high school, I think before you got there, his name was Ray Tang, and I'll never forget. Uh, I asked him, I said, hey, I'm on a merch team. I know you're a supervisor in appliances. I wanna come to the sales floor. He was like, I don't know if, I don't know if you can sell. I said, I can sell. Like, <laughs> <laughs> bro, I was selling peanuts in front of Kmart, yeah, dude. Exactly. Come on, man. I got this. And then, so another guy was there who ended up being my mentor. His name was Forrest. And um, he was a sales manager at the time. And I asked him, I said, hey, I said, I have a kid on the way, man. I want more hours and I want to be on the sales floor. And so he said, all right, we'll give you a shot. So they put me in appliances. And I, Josh, I'm telling you, six months. And then the next six months, I was a senior, which was like, step below from supervisor and then in the next like year i was a sales manager of the whole store and this yeah. is like a 80 million dollar store right right it's a huge store yeah and so i just everything that i put into like the drive and the focus i just put into learning how to lead learning how to sell learning how to do all those things and and then all of a sudden i my career had started right. and i never looked back you know and i was there for about five years and i got recruited to go to a, a, a dying company in Circuit City. <laughs> uh, before that, I met my wife now uh, in Best Buy. Um, and, you know, we created a lot of great things. And so now we have three daughters. Wow. Um, and I have two daughters with my ex who was uh, who I was with when, you know, you, when I was in high school and yeah. after that. So that's crazy, man. Like, so Janelle worked at Best Buy. That's where you met her? Yeah, yeah. Dude, look at you guys now, though. You know I what know. I mean? It's a trip, dude. It's so funny, like... Uh, you think about that, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it, the Steve Jobs commencement speech, right, at yeah. Stanford. It was like, you connect the dots looking backward. You know what I mean? Like, you look yeah. back and you're like, wow, if that wouldn't have happened, if that wouldn't have happened, if that wouldn't have happened, I wouldn't be where I am today. Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's a trip, man, because I've seen you, like, I saw you at Best Buy because I worked right around the corner. And I think when I saw you, you were, you were either a manager or you were well on your way to being a manager. And I remember looking at you and being like, man, this dude's killing it, man. Like, yeah. he's crushing it. And at the time, I was... I was at a pivotal time in my life as well, where I was like, man, I'm going to either get stuck working or I need to make a move. You know what I mean? Because I could have gone to college and played D3. And I mean, nothing, nothing crazy. I wasn't yeah. a D1 guy. I wasn't big enough um, and probably wasn't good enough. But I had an opportunity to go to a bunch of different schools and play D3 ball. And they were going to get me into their school, offer the, all the financial aid I needed, basically. Um And I was like, no, nah, I can't. I can't leave right now. And then I saw all my friends leaving for college. And here I am working at Chick Sporting Goods. I'm like, man, I'm going to get stuck. Yeah. And so I remember one day I just had a wake up call and was like, man, I need to go do something. So I joined the military. Wow. And, um, and that, I mean, I look back on that experience and it's like, wow, like I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't have some of the connections that I have today if, if I hadn't have made that decision to go to the military. You know? Yeah. And like, like you, I mean, I, um, I knew my father, but he w wasn't an active part in my life. Definitely not right. at, that, at that time. And so when I joined the military, it was all like, I was on my own. I mean, yeah. my grandma was pretty much raising me. Um, she raised me, but she didn't really get in my way. You know, it wasn't like I respected her so much that she didn't really need to parent me too much. It wasn't right. like she wasn't up in my business a lot. It was more like, I'm trusting that you have integrity and you're going to make the right decisions. So she allowed me to kind of just find my own way and just 
kind of like she was like the bumper on the side to kind of keep me in my lane. Right. Um, so yeah, it's crazy when you look back on that because now oh, you yeah. went from you went from Best Buy to Circuit City, then from Circuit City. Um, I think I ran into you again when you were at uh, 24 Hour Fitness. Yeah. So yeah. share that story. You went to 24 Hour Fitness yeah. as a trainer or as a manager? Or as how a manager. Work? So um, I went to Circuit. Circuit went out of business. And before liquidation, I was like, I didn't want to get into something different. I, I want to get into fitness, you know. And so um, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. This was like 2008 when the financial crisis hit. Oh, yeah. Everybody was just like it was mad madness. Now you're not a world, man. Yeah. You're just like trying to find your yeah. trying to find your way. It was tough. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, I uh, applied, and I was like, let me see what I can do. So I said, hey, I want to be a manager at 24 Hour Fitness. This looks interesting. I don't know. I said, what does a manager at 24 Hour Fitness do? Like right. you, know, just, right. you, know, you just re-rack weights. What do you do? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and I was making a pretty good income, you know, when at Circus City, cause I got recruited, they threw a bunch of money at us cause they were trying to save the company and they were looking for talented leaders. And so when I reached out to them, I was just like, the biggest thing I just needed to match my pay. Right. Yeah. And so, um, they did that and, uh, I got hired on at 24 hour fitness, which was so random. Right. Yeah. I, I applied online. They called me like the next day I had an over the phone interview. And then like a couple months later, I was already there. That's awesome. Right. And so um, I started there and it was just interesting because they were looking to change the way they led. Right. And it, it's been a commission environment, kind of like your hard nose sales, cold calling, all those things. And they were looking to kind of go towards a more developmental type of process where they really created an environment that was different. So they were moving away from the commission environment. And I think they wanted to try to connect with members and try to go the way that uh, many companies have seen success, which is just connecting with their customers. And so they wanted different leadership. And so I was kind of at that project. I was like the only person from the outside yeah. um, coming in. Everyone else was kind of homegrown. Uh, and so I, I started there and it was great. I mean, I, I learned a ton. I learned about fitness. I learned from these brilliant trainers that, you know, the kinesiology master's degrees and, you know, it's just amazing things. And so uh, I took that and, and what I learned most of all is how to connect with people, right? And a far different level. The, mo the thing that people are most insecure about in a lot of cases is their body. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And I learned how to create trust in very little time, which paid dividends for my own leadership, right? Because a lot of times you're, you're trying to connect with your, your team. And so, um, and, you know, that also led to me doing want to do fitness competitions and just kind of really digging and diving deeper into the fitness world, getting certified and, and just really learning how the, about the body and how it operates and how important it is and how nutrition plays a big part in movement and sleep and all these different things that um, just kind of fit who I was. You know, I, before I, I left Best Buy and Circuit, I just started really wanted to just learn more about leadership and, and like we were talking before, like public speaking. And I learned how to to do public speaking at Best Buy. Like I spoke in front of large audiences. And so just taking all those things that you learn and kind of recruiting all those skill sets. Like me and my wife talk about this with our students. Um, we talk about Mario Brothers, right? And you know, if you really look at Mario Brothers, it's a great, great philosophy for life, right? Like level by level, you can't just skip and, and try to beat King Koopa because right. he's too fast, right? And the, the level is too complicated and you die every right. single time. So it's important that you go through each level because each level speeds up a little by little, little by little. But at the same time, you got to make sure you're recognizing it. So at the end of the level, what do you do? You, you jump and you jump on the flag and you celebrate, right? right? For just a moment. Yep. And then you come back down, you walk in the door and then you're on a new level. And it's very much like that. Like the recruitment of skills has led you to a place where now you can take on King Koopa and beat it. Right. Yep. And so, uh, no, I don't definitely feel like I'm at any type of King Koopa level, but I definitely think that there's levels in which I'm learning so many things that has prepared me for what's to come, yeah. you know, and it's so necessary. Were you taking classes like when you were at Best Buy, were you taking classes on leadership? I mean, I know you were going to school, but then you decided like, hey, school is not going to be my route right. um, because I need to support, uh, support my kids. Um where did you learn your leadership? Was it something yeah. that you like read books? Was it something that you had like a mentor that you went to? Like, how did you, how did that come about? Yeah. So, um, books have been like the biggest thing for me, you know, and 
And I, and I battled between the fact that am I trying to overcompensate because I did not go to school? Is that why I'm like, like so starving for information in a lot of cases? I'm like reading as much as I can. You know, my favorite part of the, of the book is at the back where they're, t- uh, they're citing their references. Mm-hmm. Because it gives me more books to read. Oh, definitely. That's all, I never looked at it that way, but that's that's actually a really smart way to do it, man. Oh, my God. Sure. You look in the back and you go, wow, this author, this wasn't necessarily their original idea. They just build on someone else's idea. And so I think it, it, it helps when you sometimes, when you're leading out or you're teaching people, you can sometimes feel like an imposter. Like, oh, my God, like they know how nervous I am in this situation trying to help them. So but, the real, but the reality is, is that like, as long as you know that you're pouring into someone, then it's all right. Like you don't have to be an expert, but as long as you know that no idea is original these days. Oh, definitely not. You know, and so, uh, yeah. So for me, leadership was like reading books. And then Best Buy was awesome at that time. Like we were doing so many testing and, you know, and I know that the economic climate has changed now and Best Buy has changed, but they were a perfect place for a person like myself and my wife to learn a ton of things, business acumen, how to run a P&L, how to run a business. Like Best Buy gave you everything. Like you are a P&L operator, you run this business. And we were able to take all that and say, wow, like I know how to run a business now. I know how to do our like, ROI on, on this particular end cap or this particular product or right create a hypothesis test, verify from a standpoint, like, hey, we're gonna try something, test it, measure the, the, the results from this, and then we can scale it, right? Yeah. And so that's where I really learned some of the, the, some of the foundation of leadership and how to engage with people. And then at Circuit City, I, I really learned, like, when things are really tough, like, how do you make the most out of something? Like I didn't have registers. We had to build, I had to find someone in my store who knew how to contra- like build stuff to build a register because they had like old fashioned way of doing business, which is so crazy to me that we did all this stuff. Um, but I was, yeah, I learned how, what, what, how businesses work. I learned at the end of the day, sometimes in some corporations, you are a number, right? Okay. And, you know, and I would never forget when they said that in the meetings at Circuit City, they said that it was, it was worth more out of business than in business. And I said, that's myself, but there's people yeah. and, Circuit City played a huge part for me because I learned, like my biggest learning for leadership was in that um, store, in that company, when I had to let go of like 12 or 13, I think it was at that time, it was 12, 13 people I had to let go because they made 51 cents over the cap. Unbelievable. Yeah. And so I, I, I'll never forget, I met with one of my employees at the time, his name was John, and he, he, I had been like really working with him, trying to help him be, become a better like salesperson at Circuit City, right? Teaching him sales, teaching him how to identify things, teaching him how to lead and all these kind of things. And I had to call him in, right? To at six in the morning to let him go. And this is an emotional thing for me because it was like, you spend so much time with someone and you want to see them grow and I'm reading this document that I cannot veer away from. This is a legal document I have to read to them saying, hey, you make over 51 cents over the cap. Unfortunately, you know, Circuit City is letting you go today. Here's your packet. Here's your Cobra insurance, all, all this crap, right? So I'm sitting in front of him and immediately it dawns on me, I didn't prepare him for anything else except for being Circuit City, like except for these four walls. Wow under my care. And I, and I look at that as leadership, like some people or people are under your care, right? And I, I'll never forget that. I said, I'll never lead like this again. And so I, I changed everything. Like when I lead people now and I, I focus a very small percentage on their actual job task, yeah. right? I, I'll leave that for someone else to train, to train them on. Um, for me as the person, yeah. how do I help this person be a better person because when John left that room, I didn't prepare for him for anything else. Right. He was, I mean, I don't know what he's doing this to this day, but I know I didn't do my job to say, Hey, I, I've, I've given you some tools that I have learned over the years to help you be more well-rounded. So in this next chapter of your life, you, you have some things that you can say, Hey, I can use this to get this job here, or I start this business here. And so that changed everything for me. That's crazy, man. Cause I think that we all, I mean, you have to be self-aware enough to know, like to, to even feel those feelings and be like, man, I failed. Yeah. And I failed as a leader. 
And I know for me, like I was in corporate America working in the elevator business or whatever, and I had a guy quit and uh, he told me that he was quitting based on my leadership style. Wow. And that was heavy, dude. Heavy, heavy, heavy for me to hear. And I realized at that moment that I had bought into the leadership style that the company was mandating. Basically, yeah. you know, it was like the micromanagement. Like, where are your guys at all times? GPSing them. <laughs> you know, what are they yeah. doing this night? It's like I was forgetting the fact that a lot of these men, uh, I didn't have any women underneath me because it was like the elevated trade. There are women in that that uh, that business, but I didn't have any that were direct reports. But the men that were there, I mean, these are grown men, and a lot yeah. of them were older than me. You know, I mean, here I am being trying to be their leader and. And I was failing miserably yeah. and I had lost sight of the human connection, the human aspect of things. You know what I mean? It was all about, you know, the P and L it was all about the bottom line. And, um, uh, that was a pivotal moment for me. Like I changed completely. I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm no longer buying into, uh, the system. I'm yeah. going to do it my way. Yeah. You know, I can still meet my agenda or meet my quotas and whatever else I need to meet and still be a good leader, you know, and teach them, um, you know, teach them other things besides, I mean, they're good at their job and they go to school for that. You right. know what I, mean? I don't need to teach them their job. You know what I mean? Um, I need to be available to them, be an asset to them. Like, what can I do to make your job easier? Right. Uh, and be like more of a servant leader. And um, so I felt like when I moved on to another company, I, I came with a different approach. I genuinely cared about uh, my employees. I cared about when, when's their birthday, when's their kids' birthdays, um, when they need time off, this and that. And I'm sure there was things that I still did that, um, you know, I needed needed to work on. I mean, I think if I asked other guys that worked underneath me, like, could I have done things differently? I'm sure they would they would have some cr constructive criticism. Yeah. Um, but I definitely learned from that that one time that that guy quit and said it was because of my leadership style. And I realized at that moment, like, I can I can own it and say, like, yeah, I was wrong. Wow. I, I was off. You know. Wow. Um, and it's it's kind of like went into. Uh, everything I do now, you know, and I started, I woke up to the idea. I was looking at people around this office um, that I worked in and I was like, wow, these guys are like in their fifties, sixties, whatever. And they've worked here pretty much their whole life, Wow. but they're not doing anything else. Like this is it. This is all for them. This is all they care about. And I couldn't, I couldn't buy into it, dude. I couldn't do it. You know, like I think that a lot of people get stuck, you know, where it's like you're in corporate because you're, you're providing for a family and you're, um, that's your main objective is to have an income to pay your mortgage, to pay your bills and put your kids through uh, school or whatever the case may be. Um, but it's a soulless job. Yeah. Like it's soulless. You're not really doing anything that you're really passionate about. You're only doing it for the paycheck. Right. And so when I left uh, corporate in 2016, I promised myself I would never go back. Wow. And it's kind of silly. I mean, I have tattoos on my hands now, but it was kind of like, my coming out party to say like, listen, like this is now like I said, I wasn't going to go back. Now I can't go back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I'm not part of their, their little deal anymore. Yeah. Um, I saw a meme on the way here, uh, to do this podcast with you. And it was a, a picture of, um, Brad Pitt. And what's that movie? Um, where he's, uh, Achilles, uh, I think it was Troy. Yeah. Troy. Yeah. yeah. And it, the meme was, uh, you can't say that to a supervisor. And then his reply was, that's why nobody will remember your name. Uh, and I started thinking about that and I was like, man, a lot of meetings, I would buck the system, you know? Yeah. And I didn't, I did not buy into the hype. I don't buy it. I didn't drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> I mean, there was a time that I did, but I always kept things. I tried to keep things in perspective. Like what was the big picture of things? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, and it's the human connection. Yeah. It's a human aspect of things that are most important because at the end of the day, I don't care what your title is. I don't care what your job is. Um, I care about you as a person. Right. And that's where, like, I think, like, this podcast thing that I'm doing, um, that's what's important to me. That's why I love it so much is the connections I'm making with people, the stories that I'm hearing and what I'm learning from it, the takeaways that I'm taking from a lot of these podcasts. You know what I mean? Um, so you went from, I'm sorry, to, I went on my own. No, soapbox, no, that's man. beautiful, man. <laughs> I mean, it, I just thinking about the courage that it takes. And, and for you, like, for someone to say that, like, how I'm leaving because your leadership, like, you could have created a whole nother narrative from that you could oh, have definitely. said yeah because i was hard on you or because i held you accountable like you could have created this whole thing that have not given you the learning that was necessary to kind of to bring you to this place so that's that's huge yeah definitely i think that's where a lot of people fail as leaders and as just individuals is that they're not willing to go inside and say like what's my part in this right. you know what i mean and so i start doing that i've been doing that with a lot of my relationships with my wife with my kids with everything always 
being like uh, self-aware enough to be like, okay, where did I fail? What's my part in this? Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, when Kathleen and I would have like a disagreement or whatever, um, I would take everything so personally, you know, I'd be yeah. like, Oh, I'm being attacked. You know? And so I, I would feel like I was being attacked. So then I would go on the defensive and then I would attack back because that was my MO. And then you leave the conversation where there's no resolution. It's yeah. like, now we're both pissed off. It started off with just you being upset with something that I may have said or something I may have done. And now I'm pissed off and you're pissed off. And like, there's no, there's no winning here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's stupid. Yeah. And, um, and so then now like my approach with most things, is like, okay, I want to hear you. And I want to hear what you you have to, I'm going to digest what you're telling me. And if there's something you need me to do or to change or whatever, I'll do that. Um, and we have a constructive conversation about it without me being yeah. defensive. And I feel if I ever feel like I'm being defensive, whether it be in a position of leadership or with my marriage or with my kids, if I start feeling defensive, I'll diffuse it immediately and be like, Hey, listen, can we like maybe change the tone a little bit or whatever? Cause I'm feeling a little attacked right now and I don't feel like I can bring my best self right now. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's changing the dynamic completely in my marriage, completely with my relationship with my kids. Um, cause I always came with like a hard ass approach, you know, yeah. I mean? like everything was hard, 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 hard. It's yeah. like, that doesn't always need to be the case, man. You need to be pliable. You need to be flexible. So, yeah. And it makes me think of that. Um, I love mental models. And right. so it makes me think of a uh, man with a hammer, right? You know, yep. man with the hammer thinks everything's a nail. And, and, um, that was, I was very similar to that. And, and I, it, for me, my personality wasn't hard. It was teach, you know, teach this particular thing so they can do this really well. And I, and it, it just was so limiting and marginalizing of that person. Right. right. So no, a hundred percent. What's your, uh, what's your main goal? Like, what do you think? Actually, not, let me rephrase that. What's your biggest driving factor in your life? Cause I think everybody, I had a buddy tell me the other day that he said, you know, I admire the fact that like you're self-motivated. Yeah. Like there's not a carrot and a stick in front of you. You know, that's like, Hey, you know, like, Oh, if you do this, Josh, and you're going to get this, if you do this, you're going to get this. That's not my MO. It yeah. never has been. I've always been driven. And I don't, to be honest with you, I don't, don't really know where it comes from. Yeah. I think maybe for me, it's, uh, I want to provide a better life for my kids than I had, um, and offer them stability, um, and leadership and all the other, and love and compassion yeah. and all these things yeah. that I felt like yeah. I maybe was lacking in my life. So maybe that's my biggest drive is to, to build like an empire for my kids, you know, and leave like a legacy. What do you think it is for you? Oh man, it's, it's, um, so I, I'll give you a quick little story because it's backstory, right? Yeah, so, for sure, man. Absolutely. So my, my boss at uh, 24 used to say, man, Eddie, you have so much potential. Like you're so like you lead, you have, you, you do a great job. You articulate yourself really well. You, you know, some of the things you talk about, some of the things you say, some of the things you do are just like next level. You have so much potential. And I remember like feeling good about that. Yeah. I got a lot of potential. All right. <laughs> And then, you know, I, I think it was a combination of my wife and our relationship and the season we were in and thinking about those comments. And I was just like, all of a sudden it hit me and said, I'm a prisoner to my potential. And I, I, I swear I'm going to write a book about that because that, should. yeah. I, and I've already got like the first chapter, there you go, man. <laughs> but my driving force now is not to be a prisoner to that. And this unknown concept of potential is scary to me because you're basically, obviously you're, I'm not what you think I should be, which means for me, it became one of those things where I wasn't where I thought I should be. And I was a prisoner to the fact that I was good enough to someone for someone to say that they see something that's not there in me. Yeah. And I know that's kind of an abstract thought. No, no, I, I get it completely. But, though. Yeah. And, but it's just one of those things where that drives me now. It's like, I want to exceed what I even think of myself to be. Right. And, and then that's a combination too, because, you know, I'm driven and I'm motivated, but I definitely need my wife. My right. wife is like my, I say she's like my muse in a sense where she's going to get more out of me than I can get out of me right now at this particular level of my maturity. Right. Right. Because, She's a person looking at me and she has no care in the world of destroying some of our harmony to help me. And then that's a, such an honest thing in a relationship, right? Uh, most people don't have it. They want right. to sugarcoat things. They want, they want to, to make, sugarcoat they want to things. They want to make you feel better. They want to make you, yeah. <laughs> and so for someone to say, hey, I, I'll risk our harmony to help, it's like. That's an amazing part. It's an, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but 
you talked about like feeling defensive and it, I think for many men, we do that, especially if your wife is holding you accountable for something you oh, yeah. were supposed to do, or she thinks you can do it better or whatever the case may be. And so in my 14 years of marriage, uh, this year be 14 January, I had to break a lot of things. And this is something I've been talking to a lot of uh, people that I mentor and, and help. It's like, you just got to break it, right? This, the idea of who you, like this ego driven kind of masculine thing that you bring to a relationship sometimes. Um, it needs to be broken, you know, and, and it was hard for me to, to do that because I'm thinking, Hey, this is my role in this relationship. And I remember her in the beginning, like telling me things and I just be defensive and like, you know, not listening, not taking it in. And it just created hard, like tough times for us. Right. right. And so now it's like for my driving force, like it, she may some, say something that may hurt. Like, oh man, that stings. Yeah. But then when I really ask myself how much of that is true, I'm like, all of it, <laughs> right? <laughs> all of it is true, right? right? And so just breaking that, you know, and I think that's that's the thing, whether it be this, this idea that um, I have all the answers or uh, I've read a lot, so I know how, to, I know how we should be doing this. I, it, I break it. Yeah. Like, and for me, it's just becoming more humble and more understanding. And, and, and it, just to your point, like just like looking at things and asking myself questions and saying, like, should you be defensive right now? Should you be kind of strong minded on this when you haven't gotten it right? Right. right? And so that's, that's really it for me. And then I obviously my daughters, yeah, you know, it's important that I role model what I want them to hopefully find in a man, you know, uh, when they decide to do whatever. And I definitely don't coach them to get married. I'm like, <laughs> stay single forever. Yeah. No, I, I honestly, we, my wife, we want them to be uh, successful, whether it be entrepreneurs, my daughters are in um, acting. So they do a lot of, uh, like I have a musical to go to tonight. And my other daughter has another musical. She goes to performing arts school. And so we definitely like teach them to be very strong women mm-hmm. and, and not to, kind of give them that. And I, it, that's how conditioned I am. If like find a man, I'm like, no, 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 no. Yep. Do you, and, and the world will come to you, whatever it absolutely. is. You'll attract whatever you need. Yeah, you know what I mean? absolutely. That's the way it works. You know? And I, I look at, a, I talked to a, another guy on a previous podcast. And one of the things he was saying is that you should get your kids into, you know, improv and acting and yeah. gymnastics and the things that like, um, basically bring out artistic and creative energy, you know what I yeah. mean? And so often I think we get stuck in this socially constructed idea of what a man should be or what a right. kid should be or a woman should be. And it's like, right. Like you said, dude, it's part for break it, dude, break those, those, yeah. those stereotypes or break whatever the construct is. That's, that's kind of held you back. Yeah. And I think something that you spoke on earlier about um, your potential, one of the things that, uh, you know, who Ed Milet is, have you ever heard of Ed Milet? He's on, he's a, he's big on like, uh, oh, he's big everywhere, but he has like LinkedIn. Uh, um, I follow him on Instagram. So he has a lot of like motivational things. Um, anyway, one thing he said is that he pictures himself like being on his deathbed and you know, when he dies or whatever, he gets up to heaven and, uh, he sees the version of like who he could have been. Mm, that's good. And he, and he, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. And yeah. he didn't, and he didn't meet his quote unquote potential so that person that he could have been is a total stranger to him. Yeah. And so his driving force is to be the person that he could be when he gets to that, that spot, he knows that per- person yeah. perfectly. Like it's, that's who he is. You know what I mean? It's all good. And the other one I like to use is uh, Wayne Dyer used to say that like, you're going to be on your deathbed and all the things you didn't accomplish are going to be staring at you right in the face Yeah, and saying you could have, should have, would have, yeah. but you didn't, you were, you were scared of it. And even like, I mean, it sounds silly, but even doing this podcast for me is outside of my comfort zone. It's not yeah. something that I normally would have done because I get socially anxious. I get nervous about being in, pe- in front of people I've never met before. Um, my wife, uh, Kathleen is definitely my anchor, dude. She keeps me anchored big time. And so when I leave my nest and I leave like my home away from my wife and my kids, I'm automatically like I'm just like kind of wired to be a little bit more anxious or my anxiety yeah. is a little bit higher. And then I'm going in front of people and trying to like do a successful podcast. And that's part of my journey, I think, is getting to a point where anything that I'm fearful of, I'm exposing myself to it. Yeah. So like uh, if I have a fear of like open water, OK, cool, I'm going to go free diving. You know, if I have a fear of public speaking, I'm going to get in front of people and start speaking. I'm, I'm afraid of meeting new people in different areas. I'm going to start traveling. Yeah. Um, flying is one of those things. I hate flying, dude. I absolutely yeah. despise it. You know, like it's like I'm on this 
fuselage, you know, of like, you know, missile flying through the air with people I don't know. And, uh, you know, then we hit turbulence. I'm like, dude, what are they doing, man? Like, why don't they fly a little higher, or a little lower? Like, I know, like, how to fly a fucking plane. It's like, dude, I have no clue. Um, but it makes me super anxious. And part of my journey is to keep flying. Yeah. It's because, like, uh, that's one irrational fear that I need to get over. Because statistically, nothing's going to happen to me on a plane. Right. I mean, it could. Yeah. I mean, but so could it me just driving here or driving home from here. Um, so just getting rid of irrational fears, man, and being the best version that I could possibly be of myself, you know, and constantly being like a lifelong learner. Yeah. Um, there's a couple questions that I want to ask you that I ask everyone that comes on the podcast. First one being like, if you could pick um, one person, one book, one lesson um, in your life, you know, that was the biggest inspiration to you what would it be or who would it be and why? Oh man. Um, that's a really great question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, so I'll start with the book. Okay. Um, there's several books that have made a huge impact on me. Um, I, I would say that one book that really, really changed me. I think it's actually right over here. It's, um, it's a book called Coherence. Okay. So I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to the, you know, the, the, the brain and, you know, and how we, I think we all are, right? You just, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, that was huge because I read this book and I, and I, and I better understood what my development as a man has, like what is happening. Right. And I think when you codify something like that, you're really able to kind of look at things from a very intellectual standpoint, right. From your kind of your executive self and say, okay, this, this is why I'm feeling this way. And then you can really self-assess in a really intelligent way. And I think that like you hear about emotional literacy, right? Like really understanding what you feel. And I, and I think that, I forget what the number is, but we, there's, there's like 3,600 different emotions, but most humans only use about like 12 or a, a handful. Right. How are you feeling today? Good, bad, sad, yeah. angry, angry, great, like right? Happy, yeah. But I watched his TED talk. Uh, I, I think his name is Watkins or something like that. I, I forgot what it was, but he, he talked about this app, right? And in this app, it had like universes of emotions. And I, and I looked at this app and I was like blown away with all these emotions, right? And so... They talk about how to, and then there's a map and the thing. So you basically say you feel a certain emotion and then you go into this universe and there's all these subsections of emotions and you can pick one emotion and then you can like map yourself to joy. Right. right? Um, and so in this book, it was just like really breaking down like leadership and also like how I look at things and how things are like be being before I have. Right. And I was just have on a text message thread with a couple of friends. And I was like, a question was like, what is the, what is, what are the problems that most people face or what, you know? And I said, people have the concept of be, do have all in all wrong. Right. They feel like they have to have something in order to do something, to be something. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's the other Very way true. around. Right. Yeah. You have to be a podcaster to do podcasts to have a great podcast. Right. Right. And, and so many people, we say, Oh, well, I have to have this amount of money to do that. I, I have to like have this network of friends. I, I have to have this. And once I get all those things, then I can start doing. Right. Right. And so that book really helped me because it was like, you want to do all these things, but you're not being it right now. Right. You, you want to be a lead. You want to be a leader that teach leaders how to lead and you want to write a book. You want to do all these things, but you're not being an author right now. You're not being a leader that teaches leadership right now. You just want to have it. Yeah. Right. And so that book really changed me. And then Who's that by? Oh, uh, actually it's right here. I, you can see <laughs> <laughs> all kinds of sticky notes and everything, man. Yeah. Sticky notes. Hi, uh, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I like studied this thing, man. And so uh, it's by Alan Watkins, Dr. Alan Watkins. It's interesting because they don't sell it at like Barnes & Noble. You got to get it from Amazon. But Oh, wow. Um, great the secret, book. The secret science of brilliant leadership. Yeah, and so this is what really helped me with understanding that leadership is something that like you have to figure out you first before you can either any lead anybody, right? And And you're obviously we're always constantly under a journey or development of some sort. And so once we really figure that out, like 
this is how we incorporate really good leadership is really knowing that. So this this was a huge book for me. And then another book was Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday. Um, Ryan Holiday is legit, man. Yeah. That book, I haven't read that book, but he's a great author, man. Uh, the Daily Stoic is the one yeah, I've read, yeah. Yeah, and I love Stoicism. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> for sure. I love it, man. I mean, uh, meditations and, and uh, shortness of life, like I love those things. I, I, I just, you know, it's just so much insight. Are you I, a religious person? Uh, no, I'm a spiritual person. Oh, that's right. That. No worries. Uh, so I'm a spiritual person. Like I, I, I go to church, um, but I wouldn't say I'm religious. Like I don't, I don't like the construct. How would you define that, if you don't mind? Of spiritual? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think relationship. I think it's a, it's a relationship with like God uh, as a higher power. I think it, it's a relationship with yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think um, I appreciate church. Because it's an opportunity for me to quiet things and get into prayer. So I think it helps my prayer life. Yeah. Right. Um, but I'm not a big fan of the, the idea of religion and the um, exclusion yeah. of people. Yeah. Right? That's um, crazy. That's like kind of been my journey lately, do yeah. the same thing where I'm, uh, I grew up in the church. You know, my, my mom and my stepdad were like gnarly with it, you know, and I think they gave me a lot of, um, I had a lot of bad examples, you know, and, and the judgments that kind of, that came from it, you know, where right. I felt like it was almost like I was getting separated from people based on my ideology and my beliefs. Yeah. And lately what I've been coming into is, uh, yeah, being definitely more spiritual. And for me, spiritual means like being uh, in tune with who I am and yeah. what I am and also being open and accepting of other people's and their ideas and ideologies and whatever. Cause I think a lot of people, I had a guy I worked with uh, named David, uh, who's absolutely amazing. He's older than me. So I looked up to him and like, he just had a lot of like wisdom, you know, he had a lot of things that he'd experienced that I hadn't yet. And I still have, and I'm on this journey to, uh, to eventually get there, you know? And he, um, one of the things he said to me is he could, he could pick up on the anger that I always like would throw out there. Whenever people talk about God, I would get angry. Like, Oh man, here we go again. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'll get all pissed off. And he's like, man, you know what your issue is, dude, you're getting stuck on the language. Yeah. He's like, you're getting stuck on language. It could be God. It could be energy. It could be Allah. It could be Yahweh. Universe. It could be universe. It could yeah. be whatever. He's like, you're getting stuck on the language though, man. And he's on, because you're getting stuck on the language, you're, you're closing yourself off to all these other ideas and opportunities. Right. And ever since he said that, man, I really started taking the the role of being the observer yeah. and being like, what am I dealing with? Like, why am I, why am I so resistant to this? And, uh, and I realized that it was just the idea of it. It was yeah. the language that I was getting stuck on. And, uh, and I find that a lot of people are coming into that being more, or people in my awareness at least, and maybe that's just cause I'm attracting it. Um, being more on the spiritual tip, not being like, oh, I'm, I, I just go to church and, and that's it. And, you know, and then the rest of the week, I'm just a total like <laughs> off the rocker type guy. Um, no, it's people that are really getting in tune with who they are, what they are and trying to understand that to the best of their abilities, man. Yeah. So that's cool, man. I dig yeah. That. And I think, I think religion shames people. Oh man. I think that sometimes, um, and, and, and I say that in the wrong hands, right? Religion in the wrong hands hands can shame people or make people feel shame. Like, oh, for sure. and, and I and I really got an understanding of the difference between that recently. Like, shame is different from guilt, mm -hmm. right? Guilt is like I did something wrong, I feel bad about it. Yep. Shame is like I am bad because I did this. Yep. Right. And I think that that idea of shaming is not productive, but it's not helpful and it's not love, mm -mm. right? And when you think of spirituality, you think about love. Like yep. you think about kindness and community and connection, right? You don't think about like, oh, I can't believe you did that. That makes you horrible, For sure. right? And so um, that's where I kind of, like my boundary around it is. And so uh, my wife and I kind of share that same uh, ideology in a sense. Yep. So yeah, it's been really good. Yeah, Kathleen and I are on the same tip where that's concerned and I think it's more I don't think we could be together as a couple if we weren't on the same kind of tip because yeah. it would just be too, too off base, you know? And with our kids, that's what we're trying to do is like, be like, Hey, listen, I want you to have open minds and I want you yeah. to like be lifelong learners and learn everything you can. I'm not going to have all the answers. I'm your dad and you're going to expect me to probably, or think that I do. Yeah. But in reality, I don't. And it's okay for me to say, Hey, I don't know, man, let me get back to you on that. Or let, yeah. me, let me look into that because I don't really know. Um, yeah. Cause shame is, is, the worst man, the absolute worst. And yeah. I know that I dealt with it because of the, or I guess the organized religion or whatever. And I felt a lot of shame and, and a lot of guilt. And, uh, I think it really messes up 
or can mess up a lot of your programming. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and I know this, this is maybe off base or whatever, but even in like my sexual life, you know, like I would, there was a lot of shame or that was concerned or whatever. And it, I, it made it hard for me to like, I had a lot of hangups because yeah. of it, you know what I mean? And, uh, my wife, God bless her, man. She's, uh, really helped me understand myself a little bit better. You know what That's I mean? Awesome. Understand why I was kind of doing some of the things that I was doing and, um, and, and yeah, I'm just, I'm super thankful, man. Um, one of the other questions I want to ask you, man, if you had one regret, like your biggest regret that you ever had in your life, what would it be and why? Oh man. Um, regret. I'm trying to think here. Um, I think my, my biggest regret is an ongoing regret. Like, I don't think I'm always a great brother. I don't think I'm always a great son. Um, I don't always think I'm a great father from just a standpoint. Like sometimes I'm an extrovert, but sometimes I can get to a place where I'm like, I'm not communicating with people. Right. Right. And it leads to just, you know, anytime you don't communicate, it leads to an avalanche of emotions and then people create stories and narratives in their head because of the lack of communication. Like we're, we're human beings. We're constantly trying to find meaning in something. Right. And, and if we don't have the communication, if we don't have explicit clarity, right. Um, then people like create things. And I think for my marriage, I like, I, I'm not always communicative. Like I'm not constantly, again, I'm trying, my wife is a, over communicator. <laughs> What's about that? Everything. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it, right? And sometimes I'm just like, I got a process, right? And then the process turns into overthinking it. And then it turns into just not saying anything at all. And so that is, I, I don't want that to be a kind of cop. I can't think of a one event or something that I regret. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think I've been pretty good at managing like the things that have led to really beautiful things in my life. For sure. Right. Even this, like the, the horrible things, like just turn into beautiful things, you Absolutely. know? And I think that, that, and I, and I also think that there's points in, as far as a parent is concerned, where I deprive my kids of, of important lessons. Like I look at how hard I worked and how hard, how little they have to work. Right. Right. And um, that has been something I've like said, man, I think I regret like not, making them do certain things like you know like i was selling peanuts like i said like being able to generate an income for yourself is important teaching Absolutely. kids how to find a way, a way and to be resourceful like I, we tell business owners all the time like the number one attribute of an entrepreneur is resourcefulness yeah. like being able to figure things out and sometimes i questioned it have i equipped them with that right and so you always think as a parent you're messing your kids up with something right and so yeah. that that's probably it so what do you think, like, if you could do it all over, right? If you could do it differently, what are, how would you do it differently? And I'll tell you why I'm asking that question, because I mean, I've been on this journey of like trying to learn. And I think that wise men learn from their mistakes and truly yeah. wise men learn from the mistakes of others. And so I, I go to like Kathleen's grandma, you know, who's in her nineties. Um, I went to my grandma before she passed away and asked her like, what are some of your regrets? And I don't want to get to the end of my life and have any regrets. Yeah. I want to be able to look at myself in the mirror and be like, you know, and I, uh, I don't know if you remember coach DeFiori. He was the uh, yeah. football coach at Temple city. And, uh, one of the things he said that stuck with me my whole life was, uh, if you could look yourself in the mirror and say that you gave it everything you had, you have nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah. And that's kind of how I want to live my life. And so that's why I ask people like, what's your regret and how would you do it differently? And it's to hopefully somebody that hears this message We'll be like, wow, yeah. Eddie really dropped some knowledge right there. And hopefully when they get to that fork in the road or they get to that, that chance where maybe they haven't had kids yet and now they're going to have kids, how can they do it differently? So how would you, what are some things you may, uh, that you may have done differently if you could? Yeah. Uh, for parenting or just everything? Just in general, I in guess. General, yeah. Um, not, so I value harmony, right? Oh, like yeah. I want things to be. I want people to be happy around me. Oh, and, uh, and, you know, I didn't realize that it was something that happened. It was because of my childhood, why I desperately wanted harmony. Like m- my stepfather was not a, at that time in his life, in our lives, he was not a great person from a standpoint that he was, he was abusive verbally. 
uh, and sometimes physically with my mom and with with and with us, right? And my my myself and my my stepbrother and my younger brother really didn't get any of that. He was like thirteen years younger, right. and so I didn't realize how much it it affected me until I became a man, you know, and and a father that my fear of him at that time like translate into so many things, right? Then I started to un- think that all conflict resulted in the conflict I saw. Yeah. And so I avoided all conflict. So sometimes I did not say what was on my mind because I knew it would create, create a conflict. Uh, I wasn't completely clear or sometimes you have to be on- really honest with people and sometimes that may hurt. And sometimes that for me was a, a struggle for me, right? And um and so I, I think if I were to do all over again, I, I would have said certain things the way they should have been said. I would have created more conflict. I would have uh, leaned into conflict and took initiative to seek out conflict because I think it could be a healthy thing. I think when you, when you ruffle things up a little bit, um, you can get to a place of vulnerability and truth. And growth. And growth, yeah. right? And so I think some of my growth early on um, was stifled for the fact that I was fearful of conflict, man. I just, like I thought conflict was a fight. Oh, yeah. You know, and so I just stayed away from it. So that's why I love like asking that question because now it already, like even me just sitting here, like I'm starting to think like internally, like, oh, wow, that's interesting, dude, because I've noticed that in my own life where it's yeah. like, um, I had a therapist I was seeing who was totally awesome. And one of the things we were talking about is that when Kathleen and I would have a conflict, it was like, oh, we're getting divorced. That's yeah. a wrap. You know what I mean? Like it's over. You know what I mean? And I, I'm preparing myself for that, that loss. I'm preparing myself for that to be over. And he was like, you know why that is, right? I was like, no. He's like, well, when you were a child, anytime you lost your connection with your mother, bad things would happen to you. Mm. And so you now, for you, when you lose a connection with somebody, it's catastrophic. It's not like just a normal day-to-day relationship. It's like, this is catastrophic to you. Right. He's like, but when you start treating your relationship as a Wi-Fi signal, where it's like, hey, listen, you're not always going to have a connection. Sometimes you're going to lose that connection, and Mm -hmm. that's okay. But you're going to get it back, just like you do with a Wi-Fi signal. When he explained it to me that way, I started to understand it. And then when you were explaining the conflict and wanting seeking harmony, um, it reminds me of like another podcast I did earlier with a guy named Joshua Coburn. He wrote a book called the things that need said. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things he talks about. He leaves nothing unsaid. Wow. He throws it all on the table. He was like, man, I should run for public office because like there is no skeletons in my closet. Cause I throw it all out there. I don't care. And people can judge me. They can hate me. They can love me. They can like me. I, he doesn't really care. Like wow. he's very authentic and real and raw and compassionate and loving and all these other good qualities that, As a man, I look at them, I look at you and I look at him and it's like, you can feel that love. You can feel like where it's, you're confident as a man. And so is he. And I think a part of that is because you're willing to grow, you're willing to learn. And now you're willing to have those conflicts. And for me, like maybe I did that. My uh, large part of my life is I avoided the conflict. So I just ran away from it. Like, no, 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 I'm not going to deal with that. Right. Or I'll just keep this to myself. And inside I'm going to be crumbling because I'm like resenting something or I'm uh, seething about whatever because I'm afraid of like bringing this up. Yeah. And it's crazy how many decisions we make as humans that are fear-based. Oh my like God. a lot of our decisions oh are just like, so like, they're so like, it's like, dude, for the fear of loss, for the fear of judgment, for the fear of whatever it may be. It's like fear plays a large part in a lot of our lives, oh man. My God. And when you let go of that, I think, your life takes on a whole new meaning and a whole new trajectory, dude, when you just let go of that fear and just live, dude. Yeah. And just not care about like what the repercussions really are, you know, and keep your tight tribe and your core inner circle legit and together. And uh, if that's all in place and that foundation is set, then you're good on the other parts. Yeah. Know? Yeah. It's funny you say that because so we, my wife and I have kind of teamed up and this is, this is something that she has been the spearhead behind, but she owns a bakery and then we, uh, I mentioned what her, her yeah. yeah, it's the cake mama. So yeah. like, if you guys are in Southern California, <laughs> I'm telling you right now, like I had a work party and I hired a uh, Janelle's company to, um, bring a bunch of cupcakes, you know, to the party. And I had never, ever, like I had brought like, you know, food and desserts and stuff to other like, uh, company functions. 
but the like the the feedback i got on that was like man this is the best cupcake i've ever tasted <laughs> and uh no so it's legit and they're yeah. right there and the, is it glendora or it's glendora it's, like, yeah, it's uh right next on, to apu right yeah yeah, yeah. and they have been on cake wars cupcake wars and she's killing won it. just killing it and yeah. you know and she is a um a definitely an achiever and so what ended up happening is that she had done so well with that and the business has been in business for eight years um other bakery owners wanted to know how do you do it? How do you run a business? Okay. So um, she decided to create a, a course and we we got together and, and um, she basically went to this this seminar, learned how to create a course online, yeah. <laughs> came home. By the next week we had a course. And so now we have this community, all women, by the way. So my whole life is women. I got three daughters, my <laughs> wife, like everything is like, awesome. so I am like, like surrounded, but it's, yeah. it's beautiful. And, um, so now we have this community like online and, and there's a Facebook community and there's a, you know, she's at a retreat right now. It's called, uh, in real life, which I think is an unbelievable title. Um, and, one of the things that we tell our, our students is about courage. Like courage is the ability to feel fear and do it anyway. Yeah. You know, and you remember, I'm sorry to cut you off. You remember Miss Holterhoff in, in high school? Holterhoff. She was an, she was an English teacher. Sounds familiar. I don't, and, I can't uh, place so she, Well, she was an English teacher and her husband was a, was a psychologist or whatever. Anyway, when I went to the military, he gave me a Bible. Really? And yeah. And in the Bible, he wrote a quote and it just reminded me of it. I want to say it before I, because you're on that topic. Yeah. So like he said, uh, courage is a willingness to endure pain for a greater good. Ooh, have courage. And that's, that was my like send off to the military and I'll never forget it. So anyway, that's I'm sorry. I cut no, you no, that was beautiful. I, I, yeah. I, and, and so we, we, we went over this whole course, like we have this huge course and then we, we, we took some of our students, we just talked about fear. Right. And okay. it, I learned so much from these women. Like these women um, are, mo mo a lot of them are stay-at-home moms or they um, have a actual brick and mortar business and they're trying to grow it. And and it, the same things are constant, right? The fear, yep. right? And and like they say fear is all centered around the, of loss, right? Fear of loss, of losing something. And it's interesting when you, when you talk to people who want to start a business, like they have not conquered some things that are necessary to start a business. And, um, and that's why we, we really wanted to impart courage on them. But I, I learned the fact that, you know, working with women, they seem to be more vulnerable, right? They seem to have a, a, a greater honesty with themselves, yeah. uh, especially how they feel. Uh, with a lot of men, I think we, we, we have to overcome that a lot of times, right? Oh, we're not honest true. with ourselves and we're not honest with other people. But th that truth from them has taught me a lot. Like people struggle with a lot of the same things. And like, you're absolutely right. Fear is the, the center of it all, right. right? If we can get through it, then we can conquer a lot. Definitely, man. I yeah. think that... Uh... I know you started like a Facebook. What's your Facebook community that you started actually? So, so you, I, have, you have lead. I have lead, but we have um, we have Cake Sense, which is, is we do together, and then we have uh, Passion of Profit is the name of the course. Mm -hmm. And um, so we have a community in there, and then we also have a membership community, which is called a Tribe Call Thrive, right? Okay. And so um, mostly all women in the, in those in those uh, communities trying to get some more men going. I was going to ask you like, why aren't you? taking um and this isn't a criticism yeah at all, but why aren't you kind of taking the reins and starting like a men's like type deal then the reason i ask that number one is because I, I i look up to your leadership style i can just tell by just talking to you man that you're on the right track and i think maybe some of the things that you're uh, subjected to by being around these women and sharing uh, being vulnerable and yeah. the willingness to be vulnerable these are qualities that men need to learn man yeah and i think that you definitely have a place like in that niche you know of like getting men to be the best versions of themselves and be true leaders of not just their marriage but their as dads as husbands as you know providers protectors and all the above um what, what's stopping you from doing that you know i don't think there's anything stopping me right now um i think when i started lead and it was just to be honest it was an ego thing where i wanted to show everyone what i learned yeah you know and so i would post quotes or questions and and i learned with working with these women that none of that matters. What matters is how well you listen, right. right? How long you, how well you can really deeply understand a person's way that they see the world. Right. And, and so now I'm, I'm ready to do some of those things. Um, 
part of the reason, just from a strategy standpoint, we're in the middle of trying to build this community. And so me doing something outside of that is not consistent with the goal. Right, right. It's going to divert your attention. Yeah. yeah. So, but that, that's something definitely coming because it's so funny because so many of the women, they want their husbands to be involved. There you with, go, man. With, with uh, what we've been talking about and what we discussed. Because a lot of the things that we put on, you can see on the wall, like, a lot of the stuff is mindset stuff, right? There's some strategy things and there's some strategic things you can do around your brand and your marketing, but we got to get you ready to be a business owner. We got to yeah. get you ready to think of yourself as a CEO um, of a company yeah. and um, and not feel like an imposter. And I oh, think that sure. that's what, what happens when people feel. Yeah, and I think that uh, you were saying that it's uh, it was an ego thing when you started the, yeah. the lead stuff, but I don't know, and man. And I say that because I, I look at things now and I go, why did I do that? And I really analyze and I say, man, I was just trying to like, I read this book and I want to show everyone that I read this book. Right. And so there were some parts of it that was like, hey, this is just something I want to do. I just want to like have a community. Right. But then I look at it and I go, was that, my, was that my true intentions? And so being honest with myself, I said, man, that was an ego driven thing. Right. And so if I do it again, it would be very different. Right. right. So sorry. Well, it's about like, that. No, it's all good. I think that like, I think I'm probably going to butcher this quote, no. but I think Bruce Lee said, uh, knowledge is useless unless it's applied. You know what yeah. I mean? So it's like, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but unless you're applying it, like it's useless, you know, right. it's not, you're not doing anything with it. Um, but I like that community. I obviously, I didn't, I didn't get too involved with it just because I think people just get like, I think with social media in general, you're kind of inundated with all so much yeah. information and so many different things. And like, um, and I've struggled with uh, multitasking and being like, where it's like, I'm on a journey of trying to accomplish what I want to accomplish. And then I get, like, oh, squirrel, you know, <laughs> and then I'm like off on another, another tangent or whatever. But I'm also the guy that like, when I get like super passionate about something, I go all in and I want everyone to know about it, yeah. you know? And I, and that's a good question for myself, man. I ask myself, like, is that ego that's doing that? Or is that uh, just something I'm really passionate about? And I think like looking at it, like, right now without any doing like true like self uh introspection or anything like that i think that um yeah it's just passion man i'm yeah. passionate about sharing a message i'm passionate about mindset and yeah. i'm passionate about learning dude and like learning from other people and saying like hey listen like i don't have all the answers and i'm okay saying that you know um i do need to be more fluid i do need to be able to like learn from other people and be like it's not always the military mindset of like being yeah. hard to kill sometimes <laughs> it's you know being the, the compassionate provider that you know is there to just listen and comfort you know yeah um and just that's my growth as a man and as a dad and as a husband and so i think that you're on that you're definitely on the right track brother and i'm excited to see what's what's coming next man yeah where can um where can people find you like what's your main uh your main sort like your main place where people can find you and, and reach out to you and yeah so um uh cope with eddie is my instagram handle Okay. Um, I usually, I'm mostly there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if I, if I'm, you know, I'm posting things and I, obviously the things like are that speak to me, inspirational things. And I, I've been trying to use Instagram as kind of like a, an extension of my journal. Yeah. Yeah. Just things that are on my mind and, uh, just trying to just share just to see if it touched someone. I mean, uh, I do have a corporate job that I balance between our businesses. Um, and you know, that, takes up a lot of my time, but it also is a, uh, brings me fulfillment. You know, yeah. and I love leading people. I love, especially millennials and, and, and some of the things that they have to overcome in, in this society. So, uh, that takes up a lot of my time. But other than that, we, you know, I'm on my, on Instagram, we are on cake sense and, um, you can always go to the cake mamas. Oh, uh, for sure. Yeah. Is Janelle there every day? Or is that like, is she there to like, no, no, she, she has people running the show. She has people running the show. Um, I actually have a uh, coaching with one of the managers in the, tomorrow, which is going to be really fun. Um, but yeah, she has someone running the show. She's basically running a full time um, online business now, and, and it's totally awesome. Yeah, man. and it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So where can they find her if you don't mind throwing her out there? Yeah, too, so she's at um, at Janelle Copeland on Instagram. Okay. And then uh, at the Cake Mamas on Instagram too. So if you like you know treats and stuff like that, oh, for sure. <laughs> you yeah, can if definitely you're, if you're having a drool over whatever. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Oh, well, that's awesome, man. I really genuinely appreciate you coming on the show, man. And um, I think your message is going to resonate with a lot of people. I mean, it already resonated with me, and we're just we're sitting here right now, yeah. you know. And I'm sure when I listen back to it. I'm going to get some more tidbits out of that. That'd be good takeaways for me, man. So I appreciate you. And, yeah. and, uh, 
Thanks again, man. No, oh, thank you. This has been amazing. All right, brother. Thank you right, for dude. listening to my backstory. Stay motivated and stay connected off the show. Follow at my underscore backstory underscore to be a part of the journey to recovery and to see where your story goes. Or visit us online at here is my backstory.com.